Gaza mengalami pendarahan uh, teruk. Okay, pal. They deliver it by bite. It's hazardous. Nice and slow. Very careful. Borneo. Nature's ultimate treasure trove. Here, new species are discovered every month. But this is no tranquil paradise. From the highest peaks to below its waves, battles are waged daily. Men and women risk their lives fighting for this unique world, forging a better future. There he goes. Yeah, there he goes. This is Frontier Borneo. At over 4,000 meters, Mount Kinabalu is the tallest summit in Borneo. Its spectacular views and biodiversity attract visitors from around the world. To locals, this is where the souls of their elders reside after death. But this veneration offers no protection when the mountain roars. In June 2015, a devastating earthquake killed 18 people, including six children. Now there's an action plan to make the mountain safer in future disasters. Mosa is the authority's new secret weapon. a specialized mountain search and rescue unit. Some of its members are guides and porters who survived the quake. Back then, they had no training nor life-saving skills. They responded bravely, but a lack of preparation left them reeling. It's very hard for me. Two of my friends have been uh, killed during time. But now, they are being transformed into an elite life-saving squad. Tomorrow, they'll face their final test, the largest rescue simulation ever performed in Sabah. And Nuhari has gone from guide to Mossa team leader. It's quite good, actually, that all of us can be ready if anything happens in the future. This is his team's last practice before the rescue test begins tomorrow. Eighteenth of May, test day. Over. A legion of emergency services are standing by. Their mission is to rescue 40 hikers injured by earthquake-triggered landslides. Everyone is under pressure. This may be an exercise. But the treacherous terrain leaves no room for error. Almost seven kilometers up the mountain, Nuhari's Mossa team comes across its first casualty. They'll only pass this test by treating it as a real crisis. Mangsa mengalami pendarahan teruk, dan kita perlu menurunkan mangsa secepat mungkin. A helicopter evacuation is required. But the most accessible landing pad is at the bottom of this cliff. So the team must lower the victim over the edge. Oh. 
One wrong move, and this rescue rehearsal could cost real lives. Lying off the eastern coast of Saba is the paradise of Pom Pom Island. But below the waves lurks an ugly truth. Bomb fishing has turned the reef to rubble. A small group is planning to change that. I just want to run through the safety briefing, make sure we all know where we're going to be and how we're going to do this carefully and controlled. Their solution is an alphabet of concrete blocks. It, so the, the F is floating. Leading the initiative, marine biologist Hazel Oakley. We don't want anybody anywhere near it when it's swinging like that. We're a long way from Semporna Hospital, so everybody be careful. A 200 kilogram block in freefall could easily crush a limb. But the risk comes with high rewards. They believe this is the beginning of the reef's resurrection. The rough, stable surface will allow corals to settle and grow. And this block is now ready for deployment. This one's the block. Track has created smaller artificial reefs from salvage materials like glass bottles that have been a success at attracting small fish. As we've got small fish, the big fish have started to move in, and of course, the more habitat for bigger fish we can provide, the more bigger fish we'll have. And that's what these big reef structures are for, is the big holes attract the bigger predators. A team of divers will guide the block to the planned drop site. But it's hanging too low in the water. Below it, a coral nursery. I'm a little bit apprehensive. This is a big piece of cement. If the letter hits the growing reefs, it could destroy years of work. Finally, they can take a deep breath. But it's not the team's day. The wind direction shifts and the block has to be dragged back into position. Difficult, you know, to get in exactly the right place where the um, letter has got to be dropped. In these tough conditions, coordination is key. The boat has to be in the perfect spot, or the slab could be swept away by strong currents. Anchor. OK, are we ready to cut? It's a delicate moment. The weight of the concrete could overturn or even sink the boat. Holding carefully. Over to the southwest, in Sarawak, at the Matang Wildlife Center, Director of Veterinary Medicine, Leo Biddle, has a very special guest. And the first job is catching this little fella. Asunda Slow Loris. They are one of the most ancient and primitive primate species found in Borneo. But its charming looks have made it a favorite with illegal pet traders. And what's uh, always quite demoralizing is when you see the scale that these things are being sold on. Like you can buy uh, slow lorises, you know, 200 ringgits. The slow loris is no cuddly toy. It's the world's only poisonous primate. Its bite can cause death by anaphylactic shock. Glands by its elbows produce a toxin which the slow loris licks. That smell, that's uh, the secretion for whatever the toxin that's, that's being secreted. It mixes with their saliva, deliver it by bite, it's hazardous. 
Dolores needs extra careful handling. He was severely injured when he was rescued three months ago. We want to put them out, but we want to put them out responsibly and, and be sure that they survive. Leo is performing a full health check. Okay. To avoid stressing the animal, Leo places him in a bag with anesthetic gas. This guy's definitely feeling an effect, but uh, he should be unconscious at the moment. Now, Leo will have to work fast. He needs to complete the health check before the Loris wakes up. I'm just checking to see if there's any injuries. As much as Leo wants this Loris back in the wild, he needs to ensure this creature is in perfect shape. Pom Pom Island, Sava. The Tropical Research and Conservation Center's team is wrestling with a 200-kilogram concrete block. They hope this will form the basis for a new coral reef. OK, are we ready to cut? Ready. It's crunch point. If Hazel has miscalculated, cutting the rope to the stabilizing floats could capsize their boat. Ali, are you ready for my signal code? The divers position themselves but conditions are working against them. A strong current is now running. I'm concerned with my team being caught up in this current. As long as they aren't attached to the bottom, they are swimming against it, which is exhausting. Quitting now could be just as dangerous, so Hazel holds her nerve. Are we okay on the boat? Okay. Ready to cut the second barrel? Oops, there she goes. The weight of the concrete now rests almost entirely on the boat. It has to be gently lowered to the seabed. Remember? Nice and slow, very careful. Positioning is key, as this is only one piece of a larger reef structure. Slowly. One rope is too short. Bouncing off the bottom could crack the block. The surface team is alerted. Finally, it's down, and still in one piece. Once pins are hammered in to secure its position, the job is done. As more letters are deployed, the team hopes that corals and fish will return, and Pom Pom will regain a vibrant marine life. At Mount Kinabalu, the Mossa unit is undertaking their ultimate test. These men have trained for a year in search and rescue techniques to prepare for today. As they lower a victim down the rock face, team leader Nuhari knows the danger is real. The last time he helped someone down these slopes was a year ago, when a giant quake killed 18 people. This time, the rescue effort is light years ahead. But they still only have minutes to rush the victim to the helipad. Reports of more casualties are coming in, so this is just the beginning. No. 
Down at base, the paramedic unit is preparing for the worst. In charge is Dr. Grace Young. This is our disaster tent. It is supposed to be set up within 10 minutes. The medic tent is erected just in time to accept the casualties. They are going to non-critical zone to get the basic vital signs and then move them out as soon as possible. The first patient arrives and his condition is critical. Head trauma and also neck fracture juga lah. So far, vitals. The medics are trained to respond as they would in a real life emergency. It is important even though it's just a drill, it's supposed to examine as what we usually practice. As more casualties stream in, Grace must calm the chaos. Vital signs fine. Who is the doctor that in charge of this patient? Uh, vital signs paper. Thousands of meters above the paramedic tent, Nuhari's team must deal with another critical injury. The patient needs urgent attention, so Nuhari opts to airlift again. I'm still waiting on the confirmation from uh, the pilot down there. Nuhari is worried as cloud cover is closing in fast. His fears prove right. Poor visibility has grounded the chopper. Nuhari's casualty may not survive this wait. He must act fast. In a simulated emergency on Mount Kinabalu, a critically injured casualty is stranded. Dense cloud cover has grounded all rescue choppers. Team leader Nuhari makes a drastic call. Now we'll be carrying the victim by stretcher all the way down. The earthquake simulation target is to get all victims down the mountain by 2 p.m. Most climbers take around four hours to walk down the 4.3 kilometer track. But the elite Mossa units have been trained to do it in under two. Okay, move now. Other satu, satu patients, mau masuk. At the base, Dr. Grace has been coordinating the treatment for all the casualties. As the last few patients are dispatched to hospital, she notices that something is amiss. A casualty is missing. Nuhari's patient. The deadline to complete the exercise is fast approaching. So we're still waiting for the updates from them. I need. The team has to hurry up. Finally, Nuhari's unit reached the triage station. And they did it within the time limit. The last year of training has paid off. Need splint? Yeah, need splinting now. I think today communication part is fairly better. Finish it count. When the quake hit in 2015, Nuhari felt helpless. But today, he stands proud. Actually, this um, experience is quite priceless. And this simulation actually is going to give more confidence uh, for the climbers, even for ourselves as a Mossar team. Kinabalu is now safer, with Mossa standing watch. Medical director Leo Biddle must race to complete a health check on a slow loris before its anesthesia wears off. There seem to be no problems there, no abrasions or anything like that. Not a minute too soon. So the normal resting heart rate of lorises is between 180 to uh, 200. Uh, the reason the heart rate's so high here is it was just waking up. Only one essential step left to go. Okay, so now we're all good to put on the next collar. 
The tracking collar will allow Leo to monitor the location of the loris in the wild for six months. Useful information for future releases. Leo hopes this is the last time that this animal will ever be caged. Come on, buddy. It's now 1 a.m. and the loris is wide awake. This is the best time to release this nocturnal creature. He'll have until dawn to find a safe place in the forest. Yeah, this is not bagus, I think here. In here. Yeah. Dolores is hesitant. But then the forest calls. Freedom, little buddy. A lot of people think you just open cage doors and animals run off back to living happy ever after, but the jungle can be quite a fierce place, uh, full of danger, especially if you're a slow loris. It's probably just a little bit overwhelmed at the moment. Returning this creature to the wild is a victory, but Leo is realistic. It could well be that one of the owls or the eagles or the snakes that we've uh, released into here previously might eat the loris. That is part of the natural cycle. What's not natural is finding them in people's houses, in pet shops, and it's not natural for them to be sitting in cages in my office. Until the illegal pet trade stops, many of these creatures won't be so lucky. But at least this Loris has another chance at living free. <laughs>